Absolutely. Thanks for the invite. And uh, let me make sure we're recording. There we, we are recording. Um, I'm going to say a few words and then Tyler will be able to say a few, a uh, few words and then uh, Dustin Goodwin will do the introduction. Um, I want to say that this, this, we had probably about 150 people sign up for this. A lot of people because it's during the day can't make it, but afterwards we send, uh, send it out and we can put it on our YouTube channel, especially something like this, where a lot of people really want to know about uh, what Prater Willie syndrome is. It gives them an opportunity to come, come look at it and watch it again. Uh, we do uh, send it out afterwards to all the participants and all the people that signed up, and we send it to uh, other providers as well. Um, the purpose of this really is uh, Tyler Sununu from Florida Association of Rehabilitative Facilities and me, I'm Alan Abramowitz, the CEO of the ARC of Florida, uh, wanted to come together and provide a service to all the providers out there. Uh, it gives us a place to meet every month in case anything comes up and someone wants to put something in the chat to reach out to, to both of us, but also uh, to, to really show that we need to work together. There's not enough capacity out there in the state. Uh, we need all hands on deck. We need a lot of providers out there providing services. We know the challenges with um, not getting any funding last year and the funding currently insufficient just to meet the needs of the Medicaid waiver. And we're in this together to meet the needs of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. I would want to introduce uh, Dina Justice, who's on, who's, our, who's the Arts uh, Communications and Marketing Director. And Dustin, right next to me, he's our operations manager uh, for the ARC. So Tyler, you wanna say anything before you give it to Dustin? Sure, thank you, Alan. Um, you know, like Alan said, you know, this was, uh, it was really his idea, but us coming together with reaching out to everyone, you know, that wasn't a member of, you know, just our associations, but anyone who wanted to come uh, obviously every month might not be a topic that, you know, matches everyone's interest. Um, this is a very unique one this month, but some people might be interested to see, you know, what, um, you, you know, someone in the state is doing and also may, you know, run into family members or folks that, that um, this could be applicable to and, you know, have this as a resource. Um, we're just, you know, happy to be working together with, you know, not only the ARC, but also, you know, all providers to try to have one message, one voice, get more on the same page, and with these monthly calls, have a you know a point of contact where you can bring up things that are challenges uh, for your organization that we then in turn can add to our advocacy on the state level when we are trying to um, you know get additional funds for Medicaid. You know that's that's a big part of what Alan and I do is trying to be successful there to help you all be able to stay doing what you do every day. And we know that a big portion of that, um, you know, is dependent on what the state reimburses. Um, so us coming together, bringing your challenges, uh, communicating is, um, is what we hope for. And then also having interesting topics each month um, where we can hear what, you know, what different folks are doing. Uh, so glad to be a part of this. Uh, thank you, Alan, for, um, for helping, you know, spearhead this. And I'll turn it over to Dustin to introduce the speaker. Well, hello, everybody. We are um, we're very pleased to have two experts in the field of uh, Prater Willie Prater Willie syndrome. Uh, they're going to be able to share some of their knowledge and their insight with us today. Um, so we have Miss Jennifer Hammond. Um, she is a behavior a board certified assistant behavior analyst at the doctoral level. Of course, she has her PhD, um, and she graduated from the University of Florida, specializing in advanced behavior assessment, studying under the famed Doctor. You, uh, Ms. Jennifer, would you like to uh, pronounce that name for me, Dr. Sure, I worked with Dr. Brian Owada. Owada, yes, okay. So Dr. Brian Owada, if you if you heard of him, he's pretty popular. Um, she gained valuable experience with uh, the Prader-Willi syndrome during her doctoral training, um, and she continued this work at Stanford University Medical Center um, post-doctorate. And then we also have Mark Lister with us today. He is also a board certified assistant behavior analyst, um, and he's widely known within the um, Prader Willie syndrome community um, as a caring and compassionate expert in advancing the treatment for people um, with Prader Willie syndrome. Um, for over 30 years, Mark has stayed 
um, current with advances in knowledge of, of cradle wheelie syndrome and has pioneered the program at the Ark of Alaska from its early beginnings. Um, and before they uh, get started, if you have any questions, um, as, as always, you can um, either raise your hand with a little um, raising your hand emoji, or you can type some questions in the chat as well. Um, and if you're not muted, um, please go ahead and mute yourself before um, Ms. Jennifer and Mr. Mark um, start presenting. Hey, Dustin, you mind if I jump in and say something really quick? We never mind, Mark, never. Hey, Mark, right, Mark, Mark, Mark. Mark Swain is the board chair of the Arc of Florida, but he, he is also the CEO of the Arc of Alachua. Uh, go ahead, Mark. First of all, that was a wonderful um, introduction. I really appreciate that because these are two really fine behavior analysts and uh, they really know what they're talking about with this specialized population. Uh, I just wanted to correct a little bit uh, Dr. Hammond is an assistant behavior analyst. She's a board certified behavior analyst at the doctoral level. That's all I have. So uh, let's get it going. Uh, Dr. Hammond, do you want to start? Sure, I will. I will start. And thank you all for those introductions. And and I understand our our funky ac acronyms within the field of behavior analysis can be tough to decipher for hope, folks who are outside of our little culture. But um, yeah, I'm really excited to have the opportunity to present to you all today um, and specifically to present what it is that we do over at the Arc of Alachua County, um, specifically with uh, the clients that we're so lucky to serve as well as our client families um, who carry diagnoses of Greater Willie Syndrome. Hi, can you hear me okay? How are you? Thumbs up, Mark Swain, if you can hear me. Okay, great. So I was hearing some background noise. Okay, very good. We tried to do them and then, yeah. Someone needs to mute might them. might want to mute. Yeah, who's ever talking to mute. Fair, okay, fabulous. Um, so the plan for today really was to present an initial discussion just regarding, you know, what's Prater willy syndrome, what's PWS, and then go specifically into, again, what we, the ARC of Alachua County, do in order to help serve and support this particular population. Um, as was already noted, Mark Lister is assisting me with this presentation. So Mark, please, if you don't mind, keep an eye on comments, notes, although I think we're a small bunch, so folks can feel free to either raise your hands or just chime on in if um, a question or comment um, grabs you and you really want to speak up at the moment. I don't have a problem with that. That's absolutely fine. Um, all right, but we shall go ahead and get started. The biggest conundrum for me was making sure the slides loaded. <laughs> All right, so here we have a picture of, um, her name is Eugenia Martinez Vallejo. I'm probably going to mispronounce the name, but she was the daughter of a uh, Spanish King Ferdinand. This was a portrait from back in 1680. It was cited in several texts as perhaps the very first recorded case of crater willie syndrome. And it's important to note that although PWS likely has been around long before this time, um, I do find this to be quite interesting that here we have a portrait, a painting from 1680, and again, the daughter of King Ferdinand. Eugenia, she was quite short, as you can see from this picture. She was also reportedly um, prone and obviously quite obese, and also reportedly prone to what they called fits of rage, um, which those of us who work within the population, and we'll get into um, much later in the, the talk, but again, we're talking extreme bouts of more than likely, you know, physical aggression, property destruction, so on and so forth. Um, sorry, my phone is ringing. Um, and that these fits, uh, would oftentimes last for several hours, and they earned her the term la monstra, or the monster. All right. So the diagnosis and incidence of prater willi syndrome. prater willi syndrome, prater -Willi syndrome was, was first clinically identified in 1956 by prater Labhart and Willie. From that point in time, Ledbetter et al., he and his series of colleagues 
through a series of studies, we're able to identify the genetic mechanisms that underlie PWS. Um, it's a genetic disorder that involves chromosome 15. So again, individuals who have PWS are born with it. It's identified oftentimes at birth nowadays. Um, previously, it might not have been diagnosed for several years or um, if at all. Typically, there are, well, we know that there are three main pathways or methods by which somebody genetically might be diagnosed with PWS or by which it might um, demonstrate itself genetically. So the most common way is through the paternal deletion of the Q11 through 13 region of the chromosome 15. It's a lot of words. I'm not a geneticist, but the most important thing to note is that it represents itself through the absence or the deletion of a portion of the chromosome, right? That comes from the dad's side. Um, there's also about 25% of individuals who carry the diagnosis of PWS who gain it through what's called maternal disomy. So as I understand it, it's two portions of mom. Like, so it's a double, a double hit from the mom's side or an imprinting defect, which affects roughly 5% of individuals with PWS. The incidence of PWS is about one in every 10 to 20,000 live births. So when we say live births, again, those are the babies that actually make it into the world. There are several miscarriages, cases that just don't make it um, due to the genetic disorder. And Jen. Yes. Can I just interject? Please and do. This, this is the first disorder that's ever been um, identified with this imprinting phenomenon that goes on in the 15th chromosome. And there are more coming to light um, today, but anyway, PWS was the first. No, I appreciate that, thank you. My notes aren't popping up and you can see the slides are going a little, a little wonky, so here we go. Yeah, the, the genetic research that's gone into understanding this disorder is quite involved. And actually my understanding is that uh, the geneticists are now and the medical physicians are now utilizing their understanding as, of each of those different subtypes to further inform other aspects of treatment or characteristics of the disorder. Um, so it's, it's quite interesting. Okay, so what are some of the clinical features of PWS? Uh, most babies with PWS are first identified as having the disorder because they are identified as hypotonic. I'm just not gonna touch the mouse. Um, so with hypotonia, so hypotonia is a low muscle tone. They're oftentimes described as floppy babies. Um, they, back in the day specifically, um, and perhaps maybe a little bit today, but oftentimes they were diagnosed as failure to thrive, right? So there was a poor feeding, a poor sucking reflex. So hypotonic, low muscle tone, failure to thrive, they were oftentimes quite small. Um, there, there's a lot of research out there and there was actually a nice paper that was presented by Dr. Jennifer Miller and Dr. Dan Driscoll and their group at the University of Florida on the nutritional stages and phases in PWS. And what they had identified was that for the most part, interestingly, and Mark, please correct me if I'm wrong, Mark Lister, the hyperphagia, which is a uh, incessant, voracious appetite. It's been described to me as um, imagine yourself at your hungriest. And that is how they feel all of the time. So whenever you've been the most voracious for me, it's I get home from work, I haven't eaten all day, I will literally eat anything I can find in the fridge, right? I don't care what it is, and it might be cold. Um, again, it's been described to me that for oftentimes for this population, that is um, how they feel all the time. And this emerges typically very early on into childhood, excuse me, when they're about two years of age. Interestingly though, weight gain precedes that demonstration of the hyperphagia. 
And the rapid weight gain for these individuals, these babies oftentimes occurs around one year of age. It might emerge around that point in time. Um, and again, for those who are interested in this process, I highly recommend that you check out the article that was published by Dr. Jen Miller and colleagues um, in 2011 does get to these stages. I would say that one of the take home points of that particular paper is that throughout the stages of um, the nutritional phases of PWS, there's a final phase which is regarded as that insatiable, ap insatiable appetite just kind of goes away. Um, they no longer report feeling constantly hungry, constantly voracious. Um, but again, um, that's such a small proportion of their sample. It's, it's so rare that an individual with PWS purportedly will meet that final stage. They didn't have enough participants in their study really to yield um, any definitive conclusions regarding that. The power of the statistical analyses just weren't strong enough. Um, in addition, obviously, individuals with PWS are um, morbidly obese. Um, and so when we say morbidly obese, we really are saying this is a life-threatening disorder. Um, when, when the hyperphagia and the rapid weight gain begins to occur, it occurs rapidly. Um, it's not uncommon, and Mark Lister, you can of course speak to this as well, um, but it's not uncommon for us within our agency at the ARC of Alachua County to have an individual come into our program weighing upwards of 300 pounds um, upon their arrival. And remind you, they oftentimes are quite short in stature. So typically, you know, maybe five feet, maybe a little under five feet. Um, so if you can imagine somebody who's four foot 11 arriving at our program, you know, upwards of 300 pounds, that's, that's incredibly unsafe. Um, also, this is a topic that we'll talk about a little bit later on in the discussion, but we've also found that um, they gain weight quite easily, quite rapidly. Um, it's not uncommon for us to have individuals go on home visits and return three days later um, weighing 20 pounds more than they did when they left, 30 pounds more than they did when they left. Again, Mark Lister, I'm sure that you can speak to some of the, the larger um, weight gains that we've seen in terms of pre and post. Uh, but again, that rapid weight gain does continue to occur. We do suspect for us right now when they go home with their family, oftentimes it's due to water weight and so on and so forth. And we do see a, a fairly rapid drop off, but nevertheless, um, eating mass quantities of food, having your body go through such drastic shifts is actually quite dangerous, which speaks to our medical concerns that uh, is a very characteristic of this disorder as well. Uh, yeah, Jennifer, can I? Yes, Jennifer, please. So one of the things that we want to accomplish in this talk is we want to share with everybody how difficult this uh, disorder can be to manage how out of control, how unhappy, how the quality of life is just abysmal when this disorder is not treated correctly. And, um, but by the flip side, when the proper services are provided, these individuals can soar. The appetite can be controlled. They are very, very happy, are very, very social. And the quality of life can be so amazing, but it's this this contrast that that we want to get at. We we just you know we want to paint both both sides of the picture. And one of the ladies that had the previous uh, record for weight gain, fifty one pounds in three weeks, um, she just went home for three days and gained one point four pounds. And, and all of her home visits recently had been virtually no weight gain. So that, that, thank you, Mark. So that definitely speaks to the overall improvements that can be had with consistency and appropriate treatment implementation. So Mark describes a woman who went home for three weeks, gained over 50 pounds. This was a while back. 
just recently she went home and gained under two pounds. So that's a phenomenal improvement. So, and we will talk about this a bit when we get on later in the talk, but one of the key things about treating and working with clients and families with Crater Willie syndrome is that it's absolutely critical that um, the entire village come together, so to speak. An interdisciplinary approach is absolutely crucial. When we speak about an interdisciplinary approach, what am I talking about? You know, it's not just, you know, us behavior analysts that are going to work with these clients and, and help them achieve their behavioral goals. It's necessary, but it certainly is not sufficient. Um, we also need to work with geneticists. We need to work with nutritionists. We need to work with other medical prof professionals. We need to work with psychiatrists and social workers um, and on and on and on people in the community that support them. Um, but I, I think we may be getting ahead of ourselves, but absolutely um, it's, it's critical that everybody work together. Because again, when we look at these clinical features of PWS, we see, you know, we've got incessant voracious appetites that left unchecked can, can lead to death. We've got rapid weight gain that starts early in childhood and, and frankly, left unchecked will continue. Morbid, life-threatening obesity. And then on top of that, we have oftentimes, again, these are the characteristic features. Um, they are typically within the, the low to average uh, IQ range, right? So why is that important? Well, that's important because oftentimes, cognitively, they're kind of on par with perhaps you or me, you know, that the average IQ is 100, right? And so when we look at standard deviations, they're about one standard deviation off from the typical IQ. So when it comes to working with individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, they're, they're on the higher end of cognitive functioning, which means that they are incredibly bright, um, they're oftentimes their vocal verbal skills are phenomenal. Um, they have the ability to plan, pre-plan, um, and that that can work with for them and for us as well as against them and against us. And Mark, I do see Mark Lister, I do see there are two chats. I'm not going to touch it because of what my screen is doing. But if you could take a quick look at that, I'd appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Um, you. All right. So moving on to some of the clinical features of PWS. Again, um, oftentimes they are regarded as demonstrating very low activity levels. Um, this is important and this is a specific treatment target for us at the Arc of Alachua County because our goal obviously is to help them get to a safe and healthy weight range. And given their hypotonia and their short stature, their um, metabolisms are incredibly slow. We'll talk about that later. So one of the tools that we have in our toolbox, obviously, is to increase their energy output and their energy expenditure, which of course involves exercise regimes and so on and so forth. Uh, folks with PWS oftentimes um, have what are called very distinct facial or physical characteristics. This is common uh, for most genetic disorders, if you've ever worked with somebody with Down syndrome or so on and so forth, oftentimes it's quite easy to pick up on those physical features. Individuals with crater willi syndrome oftentimes have hypopigmentation, which means lighter skin, almond-shaped eyes, I've already mentioned the short stature, small hands and feet, and hypogonadism, um, which pertains to the sex characteristics. So you know, smaller testes in, in males and so on and so forth. There's also secondary health problems that are noted. And these are critical. These cannot be underplayed. And we at the ARC of Alachua County, um, I would say have a heavy focus on this right now um, in accordance with our nursing department, in accordance with our specialists at Shands with whom we work with closely, our behavioral team, and then of course, you know, boots on the ground, our direct support professionals. Um, I'd say not a month goes by that I don't hear of some phenomenal feat that one of our DSPs has made to save somebody's life, right? Um, from most recently, an almost choking incident 
that somebody was able to catch right away and the person was fine, didn't even have to go to the emergency room. Um, but again, we have diabetes is quite common in this uh, population as is congestive heart failure. Um, also to note, their, their GI system is, is very different. It functions differently. So we oftentimes do experience yeah. when GI disturbance and, and, and bouts towards that end. And also what's not on here, um, oftentimes individuals with PWS also have scoliosis, so the curvature of the spine um, as well. And then another clinical characteristic, the final one, and this is one that we'll talk about a little bit more in depth because this pertains to our clinical program at the ARC of Alachua County, is individuals with prader willi syndrome demonstrate very distinct characteristic sets of problem behavior. Um, you know, in the fancy research world, we might regard this as a behavioral phenotype, right, which is a, a genetic expression of behaviors. So for our folks, yeah. Mark, go ahead. Excuse me, Jen. Um, I saw um, Alan just uh, had, a, had a question um, about amniocentesis. Is this one of the disorders that they look for? That's a really great question, Alan. And Sorry. I wish. Okay, I somebody... had off the, so I don't really need to. Yeah. And okay. so, so, yeah, so one of the things I was thinking about is that PWS yeah. is not one of those disorders that go just that one bowl. The two bowls are made. If, if folks, me please mute yourselves if you're not talking, that would be super helpful. Thank you. Yeah. So, anyway, so this isn't it, one, it's very, very rare, and two, it doesn't go. It isn't passed down through family trees. So every PWS is equally distributed across the globe, across all races and nationalities. And that's not the case with all genetic disorders. So <laughs> all of us are at the same risk of having a child with PWS. So I don't, my hunch is that this is not something that they do test for. But the 2%, there is the imprinting defect disorder. And there is a, and only 2% of PWS have that disorder. And if you do have a, a child with the imprinting defect, there is another chance that it could be passed down to other children from those parents. So in that case, could you have a neocentesis look for it? I don't know. Yeah, and thank you for that, Nell. And I think that's a great question. And I can't answer that definitively based on the literature. Um, my understanding is that most often than not, and again, this is layperson, what I've heard is most often than not carry diagnoses, they're identified after birth. Now, fortunately, given that individuals are more familiar with the disorder and physicians are becoming more familiar with the disorder, um, I do believe from what I've heard, it's being picked up earlier and earlier, um, but I don't know if it's something that can be caught and detected in utero, like Down syndrome, right? Which of course they can often identify because the femurs are short and so on and so forth. Um, but I will look into that. When it comes to the behavioral phenotypes of PWS, again, we've already identified the hyperphagia. So there is this incessant, constant um, a, a level of hunger, right? And it's perhaps the most notable feature of PWS and it involves a really complex interplay between the environment, genetics, and so forth. Again, it's pertained to rapid weight gain. Later on, huge GI issues, um, uh, the food-related problem behaviors. There are a set of food-related problem behaviors that are incredibly characteristic of this disorder from food seeking and hoarding, um, which is just for some individuals, constant seeking out of food and access to food or food-related items. This might include items that you or I might not typically choose to eat, but perhaps they do, uh, maybe animal food, so on and so forth. So again, 
constant seeking out of food. And again, I mentioned that complex interplay between the behavior and the environment. All of these target behaviors, and, and we're going to talk about some of the awesome things about folks with PWS as well. So bear with me. I'm going to get through the behavioral phenotype in terms of why do they need clinical services, right? But I, I, I'm certainly not going to fall short of talking about how awesome individuals with PWS typically are and how fun they are to work with. But the food seeking and the hoarding, um, pica and coprophagia, what's that? Pica is eating of non-nutritious or non-edible substances. Um, perhaps you've heard of kids who might eat dirt. Um, you have individuals who might eat other items, silly putty. Uh, lots of kids used to like to eat Play-Doh, right? Some of those are um, kind of veer on the typical range, but then for individuals with PWS, it can go far beyond the um, the more typical unedible or inedible food items. Um, I, and, and coprophagia is is also something that we do see occasionally, and that's um, eating of, of one's feces. So. Obviously, you can see that this is, is a behavior that we really, it's, it's very dangerous. And these are behaviors that we need to be quite careful to manage appropriately. And then also elopement. And again, this is elopement in order to gain access to food. Um, so just a, little, a real quick story and Mark Lister, I'm sure you might have one to throw in there as well. But when I talk about the complex interplay, when I spoke previously about um, them typically being on the mild level of intellectual disability functioning. Um, that means that their prefrontal skills, their ability to pre-plan and so forth is actually quite good. Um, years ago, when I um, first began working at the ARC with Dr. Brian Awada, I would say it was in 2004, 2005, we had an individual who um, pre-planned and um, was able to get hold of a large knife and put the knife aside and saved it. Um, this individual identified correctly a real good time to put um, his or her action plan into play and proceeded to sneak out of the home and um, slash the tires of all of the vehicles affiliated with the home. So that was both staff vehicles as well as facility vans and then proceeded to elope or leave from the home and made it all the way to Circle K where they engaged in lots of theft and got all sorts of food. Um, so again, that's, that's just one example, but you can see how complex and how challenging some of these behaviors can be. Oftentimes they all merge together, but when it comes to the food related problem behaviors, again, it's geared towards that one issue, gaining access to food. It also brings us into the topic of uh, individuals with PWS oftentimes are described as being OCD-like, obsessive compulsive disorder-like. Some individuals do carry a diagnosis of those OCD, others, <laughs> excuse me, don't. But basically what we're talking about is um, their propensity to focus on specific rituals, or repeated patterns of behavior and perseveration. What do we mean by perseveration? Perseveration is this insistent demanding to, and, and, and maybe I shouldn't even use the word demanding, insistent quote unquote need, if you will, want, if you will, to keep the conversation on a, on a similar topic, on the same topic. Um, so if it's, you know, wanting to talk to you about how they want to add, you know, an extra dollop of whipped cream on their, I don't know, on their birthday cake when it wasn't pre-planned for, that, that might be one example. Or, you know, why is it that they can't have the diet cherry soda because it has no calories, even though they didn't have it on their soda? Um, Again, when we talk about the perseveration, their ability to engage and persist with these topics of conversation are unending. Um, they are incredibly persistent. And hey, hats off to them, really. They're incredibly persistent. Um, Mark, I can't 
see you on my screen, but I'm hearing you. Did you want oh, okay. to? Okay. Yeah. Do you just mind if I interject? And so, sure. about this perseveration, people who work with a lot of people with PWS talk about their high level of anxiety. And, and one of the ways that this anxiety manifests itself is they're obsessed with knowing what comes next. If they don't know what comes next, their levels of anxiety just get higher and higher. And recently I've seen some behavior plans for people um, that have been written by behavior analysts without much familiarity with PWS. And they've actually programmatically targeting these perseverative behaviors. But for those of us that know about this repeated questioning in PWS, the best thing to do is just to provide information, answer their questions, and be patient. And so, you know, so for people who don't know PWS, it can be a very, very difficult population to work with. And you end up trying to fix things that probably don't need fixing or, or aren't going to be real uh, responsive to interventions. Absolutely, Mark, and thank you for that. Um, specifically, yes, this perseveration, this incessant question asking or this incessant quote unquote need to keep the conversational topic on an area that's important to them is deeply rooted in the this characteristic of anxiety, right? This wanting to know what's going to come next, wanting to know what will happen. Um, later on, when we talk about the more specific aspects of our treatment program, um, we do have a, a very, it, it's somewhat black and white, but at the same time, you've got to be flexible with this population, but we have a PWS protocol. And every individual in our program has their own behavior analysis support plan, which these plans are incredibly long. I, I, I've been in the field of behavior analysis for well over 30 years, and I can tell you that I have never seen uh, plans that are this long with such small font, um, but I can tell you that they need to be um, for good reason. We have to have every potential hole in that wall sealed shut with a good answer, with a good plan to strategize ahead of time. Because if we don't, the clients will find it and they will find a way to work around the plan. Again, this speaks to, and, and when I talk about some of the positive characteristics of working, oh, well, of these individuals and the fun that it is to work with them, that's one of them. Oftentimes they know their plans better than we do. You know, I can be the behavior analyst for a given person's plan. I wrote the plan. I spent 10 hours writing the plan. That individual will still know their plan better than me. And that's fantastic. They are wonderful self-advocates and um, they're very invested in their own programs. And we can certainly capitalize on that from a clinical standpoint. Um, other problem behaviors that we oftentimes see in this population that go hand in hand with the behavioral phenotype. Yes, compliance issues, you know, uh, not wanting to do things, task refusals, so on and so forth. Tantrums and emotional outbursts. Um, these can be huge. Again, I er, go back to that picture that I uh, showed of La Monstra, King Ferdinand's daughter, um, fits of rage. Um, this, this is what we can see. And these fits of rage, if not properly handled, literally can last for two, three, five hours. Again, you tie in that perseveration, you tie in all of these other, other issues, the anxiety, so on and so forth. They have a, a general over, overarching sense of fairness, sense of what's right. So as Mark Lister just denoted, if oftentimes if they feel or relay that they feel that they're not being treated fairly, their program isn't being followed properly, um, that, that hits them hard. And as I noted, they can be wonderful self-advocates and they won't stop. So again, I'm not relaying this as, as problems or challenges, again, I think these one of the beautiful features of this care, of this disorder. But as Mark Lister noted, it does take individuals who are familiar with this behavioral phenotype 
to understand how to use all of these characteristics and work them to everybody's benefit so that we can achieve the goals that we all have shared in common, which is maintaining a healthy weight, um, maintaining appropriate levels of behavior, adaptive skills, um, living in least restrictive environments, having healthy, safe, fun, supportive um, relationships, um, both with peers, other friends in the community, their family, and so forth. Um, and then a final target problem behavior that is characteristic of the disorder is self-injurious behavior. I'm just going to touch on that briefly because in my, um, my, my early days at the ARC of Alachua County, um, the self-injurious behavior aspect was a main focus of my research and my interests. Um, and it is what prompted me to go on and study this further at Stanford University Medical School. Um, so I'm going to touch upon the self-injury just briefly, and then we're going to go deeply into um, our program. And I am aware that we have about 20 minutes, so I will try to speak fairly swiftly, but still comprehensively. By the way, let me go back. Anybody who is queasy, do not look at this, um, this next slide, please. Um, on the next slide, there is a picture of an, a wound, an injury that was sustained from um, the individual engaging in self-injurious behavior. So if you are all queasy, please do not look at the next slide. I will just describe it. Um, so SIB, self-injurious behavior, skin picking is perhaps the most common form of self-injury in crater willy syndrome. Oftentimes it's not it's not studied as often as the, the hyperphagia, right? Because the hyperphagia is, you know, something that folks deal with constantly. It, it parlays into other behaviors of concern from the elopement to the, the huge outbursts that we've already noted about. And skin picking is, is somewhat different. Interestingly, the prevalence is about 80 to 85 individuals with PWS. I would argue perhaps even higher engage in skin picking skin picking. Um, the heads and the legs frequently are targeted. Um, if you look to the picture on the left, that just shows a head wound that was conducted from um, picking at the head. Some individuals might be regarded as pulling out their hair from time to time. Um, the quote unquote causal mechanisms are unknown, but in my early days at the, U at the ARC, and one of the neat things that we've done through the years in our collaboration with the University of Florida, was we did run a series of studies to try to identify the causal mechanisms of skin picking from an environmental standpoint. And what we found in large part was that this behavior was maintained by what we call physiological mechanisms within the behavior analysis world. That doesn't give us a lot to work with, right? All it is is like, I don't know, you know, there's something happening internally and they're doing it. Um, so it was non-socially mediated. When I went on to Stanford Medical School to study this, this is one of the things that I brought to um, that department. We were located within the Department of Psychiatry and we had a gene brain behavior relations um, lab. It was super cool. We were looking at the interplay amongst genes, brain behavior, and um, this particular lab studied a whole host of genetic disorders, but the one genetic disorder that they were not studying at the time was PWS. So I thought, this is really cool. Let's go in. Let's do it. I'm not going to dive deep into the literature from those sets of studies, but what I can say is that when it comes to skin picking, we know that oftentimes it's covert in nature. What does that mean? They do it when no one's watching. They do it when they don't think they're being watched. If they think there's a, pro a possibility that somebody can see them, oftentimes they will cease immediately. So we use that to our benefit and we ran a series of um, fMRI or functional magnetic resonance imaging studies where individuals mm -hmm. US went into the bore. They weren't given instructions to do anything, but hey, they're alone. Oftentimes they skin picked and we were able to tap into some of the neural correlates of skin picking and some additional research did come out of those studies. My reason for bringing that up is the ARC of Alachua County, we have a large individuals with PWS who we are so lucky to serve. There's only a handful of facilities similar to our facility in the United States, to my knowledge. With that in mind, there is so much left to be understood 
about the behavioral phenotype of PWS and the characteristics that I would say that it, it's really incumbent upon us to, to try to help aid and add to furthering our understanding of this disorder. Um, and we can really make pretty key um, impacts in those areas. So um, there we go. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about our ongoing collaboration with folks at the University of Florida later. Um, when we talked about, you know, what are some of the cool features about folks with PWS? I will tell you, this is one of the funnest populations to work with. I typically don't like to overgeneralize at all, but when we're talking about a known genetic disorder with characteristic, you know, behaviors. When I came in, um, you know, it's, it, it's, um, they share several features in common. They're not all alike, of course, right? But there are several characteristic behaviors as I already noted. So we talked about some of the challenging aspects. Well, what are some of the fun aspects? Folks with PWS are incredibly social, incredibly social. Again, you walk into our building, you know, our ADT building, the ARC, and it is, I mean, like you're walking into a middle school, a high school, or, you know, early college. It's, it's they're, they're active, they're engaged, they're social, people have um, relationships, we have, you know, matchups, boyfriend, girlfriends, that's constantly an issue that we are, are contending with in terms of when those relationships go south or aren't going well. Unfortunately, we do have a social worker on staff, Marty Mintier, who is phenomenal and she helps with um, those issues as well. Um, as was noted, interestingly, um, I had participated in, um, there's several international and national and even statewide um, chapters for PWS and that's on the final slide, but one of them is the International Prater Willie Syndrome Organization. It's out of the UK. The acronym is IPSO, I P W S O. Um, they hold what are called um, Echo Summits about once a month. And uh, leaders in the field, from my goodness, you know, Tony Holland and uh, Didden and, and other folks. Um, present frequently. And I participated in one about a week or two ago. And I was so just thrilled to hear the emphasis that these medical physicians and geneticists and psychiatrists were putting on the role of the environment, the role of peer groups, the role of the social you know, milieu, how important all of those aspects are to an individual's success um, so again, they highly emphasized the importance of peer groups and social interactions, and I could not agree more. Um, that said, rapport development is absolutely critical. So as Mark Lister said, if we're going to deliver a picture of, you know, if you want to work with individuals in, with PWS and develop a clinical program, what are some of the features that you want to focus on to ensure success? Um, again, I would say, you know, that rapport development between a given staff person and a given client is so critical. You know, Mark had expressed that, you know, that our approach to just sit down and offer an explanation, right, to try to target that perseveration um, oftentimes is quite helpful. But what's the probability that a client's going to listen to the staff person if, you know, there's either been previous experiences that taught them that, well, what you tell me might not always be accurate or line up with my reality or whatnot. So it's that trust, that rapport development is just so integral. Um, and once, you know, oh, go ahead, Mark. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, this is, I think, one of the things that is so crucial when somebody with PWS is out of control, the appetites out of control, the temper tantrums are out of control. Um, one of the reasons that um, with the appetite is, well, that it can be really, really bad or it can be really, really good. Um, there's some evidence that the more people with PWS eat, the hungrier they get so they can just get caught up in this escalating cycle. But if you can limit the food intake, then the appetite seems to come 
um, much under much, much more control. And also with the behavioral outburst, um, I'm going to go cognitive on Jen and hopefully she doesn't mind too much. But um, Dr. Driscoll at Shands, he likes to talk about executive functioning in people with Prader Willi syndrome. That the, in most of us, when we experience high emotional events that are um, coming up from our brain stem, they, our executive functioning in the frontal lobes can step in and can kind of tamp down, can kind of suppress those highly emotional events. But with people with PWS, there's evidence that the frontal lobe does not talk well to the hypothalamus and the brainstem. So when people have these intense emotional events, there's no control. They just go off. And one of the things that so many people try and do who aren't familiar with PWS, they keep trying to rationalize and solve the problem in the middle of the behavior tantrum. And at that time, there is no solving the problem. You have to wait for the person to calm down and you just have to let time work its magic. But the more you try and intervene during that tantrum, the longer it's gonna go. And so anyway, it's just most of the people when they come into our program, they're out of control, they're tantruming almost all the time. And then within a few months, a few years, it, the picture just totally flip-flops. And you get these individuals that are happy, highly sociable, just amazing people to be around. Yeah, abs thank you, Mark, for adding that. And by no means would I ever disagree with anybody wanting to bring in a cognitive um, standpoint. Because again, I will say it again, when it comes to treating this population, you have got to adopt an interdisciplinary approach to treating them. And so absolutely, it's critical to understand how the brain does work. And absolutely, when somebody is highly agitated, um, their prefrontal lobe just shuts down and that mammalian brain is in control. And so it's important that we know that and we have a way to train staff and relay this information to them because obviously when somebody is at a level 10, that's not the great time to sit there and have you know a rational quote unquote discussion about what would have been the right thing to do. So um, again, all of these factors, we as behavior services and folks at the ARC of Alachua County, we try to take into account and relay to our staff in a layperson standpoint and point of view such that they can understand it, but also so that it's very specific to what we know in our understanding of this particular genetic disorder. Um, I know we're, we're getting close on time, so I do wanna speak fairly quickly. And Dina, let me know if we have the opportunity to go over by five minutes or whatnot, um, but that's okay. All right, great, thank you. Um, so I talked about the report development being absolutely huge because again, if there's a staff person with whom they've developed great rapport, um, trust for lack of a better word, I'm going to throw in a, a behavioral terminology, they serve as a stimulus or a cue, right? That, oh, Mark Lister's here. I have a history with Mark. Mark does what he says he's going to do. There's, there's truth in what he says. So Mark to me is a signal or a cue for reinforcement because he's going to help me solve the problem, right? So again, taking all of this into account. Um, other things, folks with PWS are just darn funny. You know, some of them can be extremely humorous. They get humor, they can get sarcasm. Um, and so all of that, it always makes for a very colorful, interesting day. Um, I think one of the very common uh, like aspects of folks with PWS, you know, oftentimes they're known for doing phenomenally well with jigsaw puzzles. You know, if I were to ask for a raise of hands of those who know folks with PWS, chances are more often than not, yep, they're person, they're great with puzzles, they love puzzles, they do them on their iPads, so on and so forth. Their visual spatial skills are, are really good. And again, they're oftentimes regarded as, as quite visual, despite the fact that their vocal, verbal, and expressive and receptive communication skills are great. Um, their, their visual skills are, are really, really important. And we need to, to rely on those and utilize those when working with them, particularly when they're agitated. 
Um, as I've already noted, they oftentimes have an in-depth understanding and buy-in to their own programs and supports. So again, we can use that to our advantage. Um, ah, what happened? They're great self-advocates. And again, we can just continue to list positive qualities. So here we are, um, the ARC of Alachua County, our PWS program. We've been in effect for over 30 years. It started in 1988. And Mark Lister was actually one of the first people involved in the inception of um, bringing somebody on board with PWS and developing the behavioral protocols. And I, I shouldn't be the one to speak to that. Mark should speak to that briefly. Um, but, you know, Mark, if you, if you will, just real, real quickly, right. um, describe that, that first, that first encounter that, how that, how did that come to be? Yeah. So, um, and, and I know we're running short of time, but we were received an emergency placement from APD we had little warning, little paperwork, um, and they dropped a client off at our house on a Friday afternoon. And when this person got out of the car, they were, you know, morbidly obese. They had sores picked on her face, and she just had the absolutely most miserable, unhappy. Um, affect that I've ever, ever, ever seen. And during that first weekend, I had some of the most intense behavior problems I'd ever seen. And uh, the following week, her mother came by, dropped off some pamphlets on PWS and said, this is what our daughter has. And we tried several different approaches. We weren't having any success. Her weight was continuing to increase. And we're looking at her weight on a graph and we're going, if we don't get control of this, this woman's going to die in our care. And we became very, very focused, very, very intense on reversing some of these trends. I won't go into all the details, but we came up with an effective treatment program. Within three years, we had her down to her target weight range of 115 pounds, down from 288 all her sores were healed, but the quality of her life and the reduction in severe problem behavior was just so dramatic. It's, it was one of those experiences that we all go into this field, the hoping that we can accomplish. And we got another, uh, just talking in the behavior analytic community here in Gainesville, um, some people mentioned that they had just a young man, 19 years old, had just been placed at Takachali. He had been removed from his family home. He weighed 430 pounds and was placed out at Takachali, the largest uh, institution in the state for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And he was on a home with people who were profoundly, severely disabled, were nonverbal, and some of which were not even toilet trained. And we got a referral for this individual. He moved into our group home. And the thing that was really amazing, on the day that he moved in, the other woman with PWS sat him down at the dining room table and taught him the program, the rules, the regulations, and just the relief that this man felt by being with somebody else with PWS who had to go through the same programmatic, same food limitations. It was just, just amazing. And ever since that time, that's how our program is transmitted. It's more through the client to client than it is from staff to client. And lastly, we replicated our um, approach with this gentleman. We got him down to 150 pounds, market improvement and behaviors. And so at that point, we were confident that we could work with other individuals with PWS. And we started, you know, making our services known to people through the PWS community, through Shans, Drs. Driscoll and Miller, et cetera. Very good. Thank you for that. And so, yes, there's been, that was the original inception, how it happened. And then it just organically grew from there. 
Um, as I had previously noted, there has been lots of collaboration with the University of Florida. It started out in 1991. Um, our relationship with Dr. Daniel Driscoll cannot be underplayed. Again, he's a leading expert and geneticist in the field of Prader-Willi syndrome. Um, again, we talked earlier, PWS is identified genetically. It's identified through genetic testing. Um, I do believe, Mark, correct me, but that Dan Driscoll was involved in some of those early testing. Is that accurate? And identification of methods by which to determine. Mark, let's yeah. start and look. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, Thank you. Yeah. So Dan's a geneticist, pediatric geneticist. He sees all of our clients, but he's also a PhD um, researcher. And so he has a lab at UF that developed a definitive clinical test for PWS that identifies all three types of prader willi syndrome. And now today with respect to the deletions, there, when, when that test first came out, they could tell whether a person had a deletion, was a disomy, but now with the deletions uh, and using modern genetics, they're able to measure the exact size of the deletion, the number of thousands of base pairs involved in the deletion, and specifically what portions of the 15th chromosome are missing. Some deletions are shifted one way or another in, in that region. Yeah, so thank you. So again, uh, Dr. Driscoll has just, his, the work and that he has added to our understanding of PWS just can't be underplayed. And we've just been so fortunate to be able to work with him throughout all of these years. Unfortunately, he did just retire. He used to see a vast majority of our clients for um, as, as patients, so for clinical care. So we always had, you know, one of the best of the best at our disposal when it came to seeking out, you know, we had questions, you know, idiosyncratic issues that we had to deal with. Um, Dan is still available to us. We deal, still work with him, but he's more so just interested in research and continuing with the research. Dr. Jennifer Miller, his colleague, um, is one with whom we do continue to work with on a clinical level. She sees many of our clients. Um, Dr. Brian Awad, I've already noticed, he was heavily involved in. Um, developing and refining the uh, behavior programs that currently are in place and that we're continuing to grow out of. More recently, we are in the works of establishing a collaborative relationship with Dr. Karina Jimenez Gomez, who is a professor at the University of Florida. She and I have been working together. She's, um, as we've noted previously, a weight gain when uh, individuals are away from our care has been a huge issue of concern, um, not just clinically, not just for the clients and families, but also um, for our overseeing agency with um, APD and whatnot. And, you know, it's just one that we can continuously battle. It's, it's not new. It's, it's been a concern for quite a long time. And um, Dr. Karina Jimenez Gomez has a, a relapse prevention model that she's worked um, on with other populations and is interested in helping us out towards that end. So I'm excited to see that come to light. And then as previously noted, you know, we, given that we work so closely with the University of Florida, the ARC of Alachua County has been a longstanding student practicum and training site. So we oftentimes have University of Florida undergrads, graduate students roaming the halls and helping us as they go on to advance their careers. I can tell you that I know that many of the undergraduate students with whom I worked from 04 to 09 at the ARC have gone on, many have gone on into medical fields. One's a cardiologist at Johns Hopkins, another one's an anesthesiologist here at the University of San Francisco. Um, so just really, we're, we've gotten super fortunate to get super smart, bright, energetic, you know, young folks in and who have phenomenal ideas and really want to contribute to our understanding of um, this genetic disorder and um, identified treatments. So when it comes to our clinical population, you know, on average, we have about 70 people whom we serve, not all have PWS. 
Um, the vast majority of individuals that we do serve are diagnosed with Prader-Willi syndrome. Some carry a diagnosis of what's called PWS-like. There's different renditions of what this is, but basically long ago it was, hey, these folks present so similar to the other folks with PWS, but they don't have any of the three genetic anomalies. So what do we do with them? They're PWS-like. More recently, um, people have identified um, the origins of, of some of these other disorders. So one being Shafee yang syndrome, my understanding it's some uh, disruption on the the allele, uh, I forget the precise name of it, but bottom line is we're learning more and more. Um, other, And as I noted, we don't only work with folks with PWS, we work with other genetic as well as intellectual disorders from folks with Williams syndrome, Down syndrome, autism. Um, but again, our emphasis when it comes to the PWS program is on weight management, dietary control, exercise, reduction in target problem behavior, which necessarily includes improvements in adaptive and replacement behaviors. And um, recent points of discussion amongst all of us on the clinical and administrative teams has been on working more so from an antecedent standpoint and identifying those potential precursors to problem behavior so that we don't even have to deal or work with a behavioral crisis. What we wanna do is work specifically with those cues and signals that indicate that a client or an individual is beginning to have a difficult time beginning to struggle and using those potential pre precursors as points of intervention. Um, and then again, uh, this picture here is just representative of unfortunately somebody who um, he is no longer around but shows what a, a remarkable weight reduction he was able to attain within the Alachua counties, uh, the ARC program. You know, obviously we have residential, ADT, administration, person-centered planning, nursing services, social work. Um, we work collaboratively with psychiatric services from consultation with Dr. Emil and his individuals who come in and we have med review and we work closely with them on up to folks at the University of Florida, Shands and at the VISTA programs. Um, if our individuals are experiencing such a tough time that they must receive either short-term care away from the ARC through either a Baker Act or whatnot, oftentimes they will go to um, VISTA or SHANS and we will work closely with them. Um, and coordination, as I noted, with the genetics department and then as I had already stated, behavioral services, um, the residential services, we are 24-7. We have approximately, um, I think that number is wrong. Um, I believe we have 12 IB homes um, and, and growing. We have apartments and supported living. Our ADT programs open Monday through Friday. We serve our clients, others in the community. We focus on community integration, vocational aspects. Um, in terms of, I, I'm, I'm bringing this home. This interdisciplinary approach is absolutely critical. Um, we also work with folks in nutrition and we're focusing more so on um, trying to establish a collaborative relationship with Michael Tang, who is a nutritionist who works closely with Dr. Miller. He's very on the up and up when it comes to the nutrition needs of folks with PWS. And that's something that we're also looking at in depth in terms of improving our program. Um, I'm not gonna go into this in depth, our behavioral services department. Yep, we've got a lot of board certified behavior analysts. It's needed. You need folks who, under, who have a deep understanding of behavior analysis, but as Mark Lister noted, that's not enough. It's necessary, but not sufficient. Um, you ha also have to have a deep understanding of Prader-Willi syndrome because without that, we could actually do um, make a counter therapeutic recommendations. Um, we have roughly nine what we call behavior technicians. Most of these are University of uh, Florida students. And then again, the behavior services department, we oversee all aspects of clinical care as it pertains to, you know, the implementation of the behavioral program, staff training, oversight, and so forth. What I think I'm going to do now is just really just fast forward because I do know that we're about 10 minutes over. Um, one, things that I, one thing that I do just want to bring home again is when it comes to working with this population, it's incredibly important that we work with all team members from 
the family because they're part of the team, the client, they're part of the team, the behavior analyst, um, nursing, the physicians, the home staff, the residential program directors and managers, and so on and so forth, because we have to outline these treatment objectives that are included in the support plans. And if we don't have buy-in, it's not going to get implemented. And so obviously it's incredibly important that we um, work collaboratively and in a bi-directional manner with everybody on the team to identify program plans and treatment plans that will be implemented to help to reduce those behaviors that are targeted for reduction and improve those adaptive skills. Um, obviously, you know, we got to take data. That's critical. One of the things that we haven't talked about when talk comes to the PWS program and protocol is that, you know, it's, it's very ingrained in me and Mark Lister and Mark Swain and other folks on this call who work at the ARC of Alachua County, but we do have a lot of, um, supports and, and, and additional items that we utilize to help support each client's program from calorie sheets, right? Like these calorie sheets are critical. Anyone who doesn't work with someone with PWS, you're probably looking at me like, what are you talking about? And I understand it. But individuals with PWS, they have what we call the base calorie allotment. So that's a calorie allotment that's been determined by their physician as necessary to without any additional exercise and whatnot, what would be a good calorie range, right? Or calorie daily um, intake for that individual if they were to exercise such that they would lose weight steadily to finally achieve their target weight range, right? So for some individuals with PWS, this base calorie allotment might be as low as 800 calories a day. Think about that, 800 calories a day. I'm confident I ate more than that sitting at dinner last night. And then let's not add the cheesecake that I had on top of it, right? So- hey, Jen, do you mind if I make a comment about that? Do go for it. So check this out. You hear 800 calories a day and you think, boy, they're starving people. Um, People with prader willi syndrome are very unique and specialized. This is a rare genetic disorder. So their physiological system works very different than ours. And they're at risk for all sorts of things, including sepsis, blockages. Um, they can pass away very quickly. Um, you eat a cheeseburger, two hours later, it's digested. For a person with PWS, a day later, they're still working on it. So things can build up and things can become acute very quickly. They can be on an 1100 calorie diet per day and gain weight. So it's very specialized, it's very different. And I guarantee you, we would. there's no starving going on or anything like that. It's a very peculiar, unique syndrome with special needs. And the thing that I want to mention here is, you know, in the end, this is about families. I've met so many families, moms and dads with people in their family with PWS. This can be a devastating diagnosis. They start off failure to thrive and then they start eating and it doesn't stop. And it has this progression it goes through. The tantruming can be unbelievable. That takes place closer to age 10. The medical stuff comes in. Um, Families go through enormous stress. People don't understand PWS. This is an interesting fact. There's only 14 states in these United States that recognize PWS on their waiver. It's one of the most devastating diagnoses a person with IDD can have. And if not properly treated, like Mark said, things can go in a great direction. But if the proper supports aren't in place, these folks are in big trouble. Or if someone just thinks, oh, this is just about overeating, I'll just control the appetite. Really serious consequences can happen, yet only 14 states recognize it on their waiver. So what's interesting here is this rare genetic disorder has a real powerhouse of families behind it. You have PWS USA, which is family driven. They're out of Florida. We just went to the conference. Ipso, as Jen just mentioned, the International Potter-Willie Syndrome, high horsepower, 
high levels of research, uh, medical professionals backed by families working on this genetic syndrome, trying to make advances in it. Uh, Dr. J uh, Dan Driscoll, who we operate with, uh, he developed the genetic testing. He sat down with me and he said, Mark, in the beginning, all we could see is the forest. Now we can see the trees. They're getting into what's going on here, what's happening. Uh, pe people with Prader-Willi syndrome are just beginning to be understood. When we first started this program, people with PWS would die at age 30. Now they're into their 60s. Everything is transforming. Um, so we are interested in research because in responsible way to help better the knowledge of how to treat Prider-Willi syndrome so we can better address people's needs, help them to live happy lives, restore families, have people come back together and cooperate with families, cooperate with the medical professionals. But the bottom line is if you run across someone with PWS, in, in Northeast region in APD, because of our presence, they happen to be familiar with PWS. In other regions, they're not even sure what it is. They've heard it before. They don't know quite how to develop a cost plan for it. They're quite not sure what to do. Um, so sometimes people with uh, Prader-Willi syndrome can really fall through the cracks and end up in a really horrible situation without the right supports. And my heart goes out to, to people with PWS in other states, they don't have a single group home to address it. Um, so there's a lot of people with PWS and their families that are out there suffering. So getting this word out today is so important. And I, I couldn't have scored better with hiring Jen Hammond, I'll tell you that right now. She's amazing. And Mark Lister has been around for so long, is so compassionate and so knowledgeable. Um, but I just wanted to throw in my two cents. I'm so proud of the, the work that's, that's being described by these slides. And I just wanted to emphasize that um, when it gets right down to it, we're talking about human beings coming from families with a very unique and special um, genetic syndrome that falls under our purview um, that people need to know about. Because when you run across someone with PWS, you'll understand and you'll help get the right referral and help get that person to where they need to be. Because sometimes even the professional you're talking to doesn't realize it. The doctor that you're talking to doesn't realize it. It really needs to get to PWS USA or get to us so we can start developing and put together the right supports. Because a lot of people try to do the right thing for PWS, but they don't because they lack the knowledge and then it ends up in a really terrible outcome for the person. Thanks, Mark. And, uh, Dr. Hammond, um, <clears throat> uh, I want you to keep going. Don't be so worried about the time because this is important information to have out there. But I'd like you to address what if there's a waiver support coordinator out there and they have a client maybe that's um, on, on because of intellectual disability. But after hearing this, they're thinking maybe my client has uh PWS. So what would they do? Okay. So um, I will, my, my brief answer and I'll, I'll backtrack. And I also want to speak to what Mark Swain had just stated. Um, number one, feel free to contact us. Any one of us. We've got Mark Swain's email on here, mine, my cell number, Marty, Mark Lister, Johnny Adams, who's the director of programs. Anybody can contact us at any time. We are here. We want to support people. When people reach out to me, or sometimes I talk to people and do consults, and the individual doesn't even, has no idea what PWS is, but they start describing the individual, I will ask, has this individual ever had genetic testing for PWS? And they look at me like, what are you talking about? What's that? So that usually is one of my first recommendations is, you know what, try to get them in for genetic testing, not try to, definitely get them in for genetic testing. It's very easy to test for. It's very common nowadays. But if somebody also just needs somebody to speak to, they need a listening ear, they want to ask questions specific to their loved one and their situation, by all means, please reach out to us. Um, we've all spent, I want to say, countless hours on phones with individuals who just simply need help and assistance. And I'll tell you, if I were one of those parents, 
I would want somebody to do that for me, you know? Um, and, and to Mark Swain's point regarding, you know, I think Mark began talking when we were talking about the base calorie allotments being so crazy low. And if somebody doesn't know PWS, you would, you'd think that you're starving the person, right? And so how important it is to have a support team that understands PWS and then can also go to bat and advocate for the family because I'll bring something up. We, we recently and currently, in fact, the mom had called me this morning and I need to call her back, but um, we have an individual who's looking to move into our program. And when someone moves into our program, we need a base calorie allotment because just for the reason we just described, people, if they don't know PWS, will think that it, it's, well, you know, by definition, it is restrictive, right? We are restricting access to food. So um, we need to make sure that we have a written order, a prescription, so on and so forth. Well, this family originally had gotten a written order and a prescription from a medical professional, from a nutritionist. It was, Mark Swain, correct me if I'm wrong, the base calorie allotment was like 2,100 calories a day. And everybody looked at this like, oh my goodness gracious, this person's gonna, they're gonna gain weight. What is this? And so working with mom, mom said, they won't listen to me. They tell me if it goes anything lower than that, it's not healthy, so on and so forth. So the plan was perhaps for me to hop on the call with mom um, and uh also speak to this this professional um but again you know people people in who in are in the medical profession who are in nutrition who say they understand prader willi syndrome i mean oftentimes we get very clear cut data that indicate um the contrary so um absolutely yes we are here we want to support the families we are very much so wanting to give back to the community um, I'm all over the place here with the slides. Um, I, I'm just briefly going to go over, um, you know, some of the things that we have to keep in mind, right? Because I could, it could be a whole nother talk for me to talk about our PWS protocol, okay? And we don't have time for that today. So I'm just going to tell you that um, the clinical oversight is crucial staff um, education and ongoing support is absolutely crucial. Um, oftentimes, well, not oftentimes, before they begin working with clients, they have to go through 20 hours of what we call didactic or talking at you training, which research shows isn't really effective, but it's requirement nevertheless. So we know that when somebody walks out of a training, they've gained some information. And we've also incorporated some other aspects of training such that we can give them boots on the ground experience experience to at least, you know, see some of the clients, walk through the protocols. We're going to make more use of videotape examples. We go through crisis intervention training. But beyond that, that's just the very early, you know, introduction, introductory training. Training's ongoing. Training's fluid. Training's daily. Training is every single time you come in contact with an individual or a staff person. Um, we have to provide daily assistance of behavior management and supports. Again, we're a 24 seven um, operation. So that means on into the evenings, weekends and holidays, it never stops. It absolutely takes the village. Again, I'm gonna drive home this interdisciplinary approach. We must be working closely with the behavior analysts, the nurses, genetics, um, the service coordinators, the families, um, the nutritional, folks, um, sometimes cardiologists, again, you know, on and on. And again, as I noted at that uh, Ipso Echo Summit that I participated in a week or two ago, I was so happy when I heard this well-regarded psychiatrist leader in the field. These words came out of his mouth. You don't treat the client, you treat the environment. And I was just like, yes, that is, you, you couldn't say it more succinctly than that. And that is what we try to do at the ARC of Alachua County. So what are some of the things that we have to do? We gotta keep food locked up. We just have to. Um, again, clients are really savvy. They're gonna find food when it's not looked up, uh, locked up. They're gonna take, they're very opportunistic, right? I'm not saying that's a bad thing. They're just aware of their environment. They're aware of their cues and they strike when the moment is right. Um, 
food-related problem behaviors that are managed. These are all acronyms, I apologize, but even entering a food-restricted area, which is what EFRA stands for. This is something we monitor. This is something that most clients are not able to do without permission. They're not able to just walk freely into the kitchen. They must ask permission ahead of time. Now we do have some clients because we work on feeding programs, right? We start off as restrictive as we need to be, but our goal is to remove all of that so that they can be, you know, as independent as possible, but still safe, healthy, right? Um, we do have some individuals that don't have to ask that aren't, aren't targeted for EFRA. CSM, this stands for calorie sheet manipulation. They complete their calorie sheets the day before. They identify what they're going to have for breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks. All of this rules out that guesswork, right? We were talking about perseveration, anxiety, so on and so forth. Anything that we can do to cut that out, we do it from the get-go. So their calorie sheets are done. So if they make any, you know, unapproved modifications to their calorie sheets, or, you know, maybe I have chicken wings on there and it's 230 calories, but I erase it and I make it 150, someone catches it, there are... Um, there are some infractions for that. It's more so they don't earn certain incentives for maintaining their calorie sheets. There's unauthorized food possession, inappropriate food consumption, all sorts of acronyms that are surrounded around this. But again, um, just it goes back to that constant supervision around food at all times. Even any receptacle like trash cans and so forth that might retain food items, we have to be careful of. Again, close monitoring and coordination with nursing and the medical teams. Again, going back to the GI issues, um, our folks are getting older. They are living longer. So I think that, you know, it's reasonable to conclude that we are encountering um, more medical issues than we might have previously. I can tell you this is anecdotal, but in my personal experience, I was there five years ago and now, thank goodness, I'm back. But I see a lot more incident reports pertaining to medical issues than I ever did back in the early 2000s. Why is that? I don't know. Is it because they're getting older? I, I, I really don't know, but this is something that we're looking into. Again, these, these GI issues, um, we want to work closely with Michael Tang and nutrition on this. And again, this is just a summary. There's so many factors that we need to take into consideration, but all of this requires a team approach. Um, and again, to go back to your question, Alan, regarding, hey, what if there's a service coordinator, they think they might need help. Um, please pass along this information. Um, I will take a call anytime, any day, so long as my phone is on and I'm not doing something else. And if I am, leave a message and I'll call back. I know Mark Swain, as you know, he has a heart of gold. He'll talk to anybody, as will Mark Lister and others on here. So um, we want to support families. We want to get the word out. Um, you can make great traction with this group, um, but it's got to be done right. Dr. Hammond, uh, Mark, Mark Lister, uh, Mark Swain, we appreciate you. The passion's obvious. And uh, I, I just really appreciate you taking the time to do this. We'll be able to put this out there and help educate the community. And we'll send it out to the waiver support coordinators too. Uh, some of the stories you told, you know, it tells me that everyone needs to know about this because if we have uh, 10,000, uh, we probably have a thousand people in Florida with, given the statistics you gave, we probably have about a thousand people in Florida with PW, uh, uh, PWS, uh, given the statistics. And that, I'm so glad you brought that up because actually those statistics, the prevalence of one in 10 to 20,000 live births, many suspect that's actually an underestimation that many cases do go undiagnosed as well. So absolutely, yes, we do need to spread the word because help is out there. Yeah, and, uh, and I'm sure you're going to get a lot of calls out of this because, uh, you know, being one of the only states that, that, that focuses on this and in Arc of Alachua being the leader in this issue. Um, and we're going to be sharing this with Arca United States too, so they can uh, see it too, because it might be able to help other states understanding this. But we're going to have to end now. Uh, thank you again, Mark Swain, your team is awesome. And uh, thanks for putting this together. Have thank a great you, time. Paul.
Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks for the opportunity. Have a good day. Dina, we'll be in contact regarding the slides. Okay. Bye, folks.